Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out on what has been our, the first decent uh, weekend weather that we've had, right, in, in months. So I appreciate your sacrifice um, by coming indoors. I don't know about the rest of you, but the traffic was appalling getting over here. So everyone's out doing their milling thing. Um, so again, at any rate, thank you. Thank you for coming. My name is Leslie Sin. I am a veterinary behaviorist. Uh, the best way that I can explain veterinary behaviorist to you is that we're kind of the equivalent of uh, a psychiatrist in human medicine. So background is, in, is a medical background, in this case veterinary medicine, and then we do three to four years of additional studies specifically in the area of, of behavior, um, looking at um, pathology, looking at uh, neuroscience, looking at psychopharmacology, um, looking at welfare, and the specialization is a generalized specialization, and by that I mean we are expected to have knowledge of all species of animals, all the way from mice to uh, lecking behavior in, in uh, antelope in Africa. Um, you can look that one up. But at any rate, uh, the bulk of the clinical work is, is, as you might imagine, dogs and cats, because that's what people, people own. Um, there are not a whole lot of us. There are about 78 of us now combined in North America, Canada, um, and Australia. So we only half jokingly refer to ourselves as unicorns. So there you go. I don't have my horn on today, but, but that's, that's the background. Um, the topic for today is one that's near and dear to my heart, which is uh, the reactive dog. As um, anyone who has a dog can tell you, and, and most of the trainers in this room can tell you, reactive dogs are a dime a dozen. It's a very, very, very common problem. It's kind of my impression, actually, that reactivity has increased over time. Um, and actually, I think that's probably true, but most likely associated with our rapidly urbanizing and suburbanizing environment, which is causing these poor dogs to be exposed to such a huge number of, of stimuli in the environment. Rural hound dog on the back 40, not so much. Dog at a, um, a bistro in Georgetown, all the time, right? So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Before I get started in specifics, I did want to do a shout out to Maddie's Fund. Maddie's Fund has provided the financial support to have this particular uh, lecture along with several other lectures that have been presented uh, videotaped and the idea behind that is to take key important information and make it widely available and widely distributed so that people that might not have the resources otherwise or the access otherwise remember the unicorn story right can actually be able to have good science-based information that they can use to help their pets and keep keep them in their home um, your dog's friend if you're not aware, it's a local um, uh, charity, uh, nonprofit organization here in the DC metro area at, whose primary goal is specifically to educate people in order to better help them keep their dogs in their home. In other words, to prevent relinquishments, especially because of behavioral issues. So uh, a shout out for your dog's friend. Um, this is just a little bit about, about Maddie's fund and Maddie's story. Maddie was actually a, a lovely little schnauzer um, that was owned and has been um, provided a great source of love and support to her owners. And her owners, to honor her memory, established Maddie's fund. And they do a variety of really uh, superb um, outreach projects, everything from public service announcements to leadership awards to, to grants and to events like, like this. Um, so that's a little bit about Maddie's Fund. Certainly check them out when you, when you get the chance. So let's talk about uh, reactivity uh, a little bit, if I may. Uh, reactivity is a, a, a definition of a characteristic rather than an actual diagnosis. It's not a behavioral diagnosis. So, it is a characteristic that we see, and it's a dog that reacts over the top to an everyday uh, situation or stimuli. So examples of 
reactivity in dogs might be a dog that's out on a leash, it sees another dog a block away, and it becomes Cujo. Right? You've probably seen it. Uh, could be other stimuli, though. Could be people, could be objects, could be uh, bikes, sounds. There are a lot of things that can cause, quote unquote, reactivity um, in dogs. So you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? You're going through the neighborhood, and it's that dog that, that loses it as you're walking along. Um, you, you, you had the, the, the stimuli may have not done nothing except walk by. Uh, you're, you're, if you're the recipient of that a behavior, so very, very annoying, right? And it's a, a situation that causes you to feel like you're being judged. <laughs> you're, you're that that dog owner with that dog that can't keep it under control. Oops, sorry. There we go. Okay. So it's a, it's a vicious downward spiral for sure. Uh, basically, um, you get embarrassed, so you stop wanting to walk uh, the, the dog. You start to avoid the walks because the dog is uh, uh, not getting any, being taught what it is that they do want to know or, or what it is that they should be doing. Um, they get less and less exposure, less and less experience. And uh, you start wondering, you know, why it was that you got the dog in the first place. You know, all you wanted was a dog to walk. And it, it, it ends up being kind of this downward, down the spiral. I mean, why, why did you get the dog in the first place, right? So how many dogs are, are reactive? How big a problem is it? I mentioned this at the beginning of the conversation when I started to talk. Uh, it's our impression that it's a very, very common problem. I would say... Uh, half to three quarters of the dogs that I see in my practice are reactive in some shape, form, or another. And I get that, those kind of numbers as well from dog trainers that I speak to. I know that a very popular uh, course or class that's taught through your dog's friend, both online and in person, is a reactive dog course or class. So it's a very, very common uh, issue or problem. So. What kind of stimuli do these dogs uh, react to? Uh, well, as I mentioned, probably one of the number one reactions or stimuli is other dogs. But it could well be people, kids, um, um, all kinds of things along those lines. Hang on just a second here. Let me do this. Probably help. So uh, apart from barking and lunging, what kind of behaviors are you going to see? Uh, in some cases, it, it escalates to the point of things like uh, spinning, um, possibly even redirected a direction at the owner, where they reach out and bite the owner, uh, salivating, uh, retreat behavior, uh, actually leaping. I have a number of, of clients who talk to you about, about their dog leaping so hard that the, a dog is actually flipped on its back because the lunging is so, so severe. Um, so, it a, a, can be pretty marked behavior. Uh, the stimuli, like we talked about, dogs, uh, other animals, uh, squirrels right now this time of year. So I've had a lot of clients who've told me that their dogs were doing just fine through the wintertime, and now they seem to be going downhill. Well, the stimuli, of course, is the squirrels that are coming out now after winter hibernation and are running amok. At, starting to get ready for the breeding season, and the dogs are constantly being bombarded by these little furry things running by. Um, we mentioned wheeled objects, skateboards, bicycles, baby carriages are often a source of reactivity, and then things like cars and buses and, and uh, things of that nature. OK, so we've defined the issue or the problem. We've described what the behavior looks like. Uh, what are some questions that you should ask before we move forward with trying to determine a plan of action, what we're going to do, or, or how, or if we're going to be able to, to deal with this? So some of the questions that I ask my clients to try to get a feel for how severe the issue is or the problem is, is um, has your dog's response changed over time? In other words, are they getting worse? And as a general rule, 
if you do nothing to intervene and you continue to get on out there trying to quote unquote socialize your dog, by gosh, by getting them out there every day, the dog will get worse. So that's the general trend. Over time, they will get worse without some kind of intervention um, to, to teach them how to behave otherwise, right? Um, when you're out and about and the dog is exposed to whatever stimulus it is that sets them off, can you at some point, in some way, get the dog's attention? Talking to it, walking away from the object, shoving chicken in front of its face. Is there some way to get the dog's attention? If the answer is, um, my dog sees the dog on the other side of the football field, and even with chicken in front of its face, I cannot get its attention, that's a problem. Because <clears throat> you have no starting point to work from in terms of altering their behavior. Um, is there any way to distract the dog? Can you give it a chew? Can you invite it to play? Can you run from it? Can you? I don't know, give it kisses, something, something to get its mind off of whatever it's worried about. If the answer is yes, you've got a starting point. If the answer is no, then you've got a more severe problem. And at what distance is your dog reacting? So if the dog is fine until somebody's fluffy thing on an extended leash gooses them on the butt, you've got plenty to work with. You, that's something that you can deal with. If your dog is reacting, two blocks down on the road, that's much more difficult to deal with, right? Because it's, it's reacting from a, a, a very big difference in your maneuvering room. What you've got to work with is limited. OK. So that helps us kind of set our parameters and determine how bad a problem we have um, and determine where our starting point is. So, before we dive into this, you have to realize that the, our purpose of, with all of this is not to make your dog into a social butterfly. That is not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to fix your dog. We're not trying to um, make him to the point where he's happy meeting any and every dog out there or every, every person out there. Um, we don't want to uh, create the false illusion that somehow or other everything will now be okay and you can just turn them loose. No, you have a dog with an issue or a concern and what we're going to do is work on providing some tools to allow you to deal with that in day-to-day -day life, but your dog is not fixed. Your dog has a problem and what you're doing is managing it, <coughs> mitigating it, treating it, teaching it alternatives, but the dog still has a problem. So keep that in mind. What it's going to allow you to do, hopefully, is be able to walk down the sidewalk without your dog turning into, into Cujo um, and allow you to walk in and out of uh, the vet clinic, uh, get your business done, do what you need to do. Having your dog walk politely by, his, by your side and give you his, give you his attention. Um, but again, it's because of the training and teaching him an alternative behavior as compared to fixing him, quote unquote, fixing him. Okay. So how does leash reactivity occur? Um, what is it that, it that makes dogs do this or makes them this, this way? Um, one possibility is that it's a protective mechanism. So I can't tell you the number of clients that walk into my facility and say, um, Doc, my dog was fine until I was out walking him and he got tackled by the two neighbor's dogs that were running off leash. Now, when I take him out, every time he sees another dog, he, he just goes nuts, right? So in that situation, the dog may be adopting the best uh, defense as a good offense as in stay away, stay away, stay away, uh, because of a traumatic event. Now, a lot of the dogs that I work with are rescue dogs, dogs that come from shelters. We have no history on them. We have no idea you know, what did or did not happen to them. Um, and that's, that's OK. I mean, you deal with what you got at hand, right? Um, but in some situations, a specific history is known, and you are well aware of what it was that set that particular dog off. Um, in our crowded urban environments, 
Um, we have sidewalks with, with cars, right, that make uh, foot traffic difficult. We have walking paths that funnel everybody onto these little narrow paths. And that is behaviorally inappropriate for dogs. So when dogs greet, they do nose to tail, and they do it in um, circular motion. So they don't run right at each other. They go around in circles. They sniff each other's butts. They exchange information. It's not head on. When they're on leash, the only choice that they have, as a general rule, is to approach head on. And those sidewalks and those paths funnel all the dogs approaching head on. And that can be very intimidating and set the stage for aggression. That is aggressive stance in dogs. Pulling on the leash elevates their body posture. Straining and staring ahead makes them stiff. And now they're coming at each other head on. That is a very aggressive stance. So that might be part of the problem. Uh, we mentioned the possibility of trauma. It may be that they have no social skills. Depending on what kind of a life they led, uh, depending on what their upbringing may have been, they may have never had the opportunity to play with and interact with other dogs. And I've had a number of dogs, believe it or not, that seem to be almost breed specific. So you wonder, we've bred these breeds to be so distinct morphologically and in their behavior patterns. You wonder if we're getting to the point where there's potentially even a communication issue between some of these dogs. Um, so for, to give you an example, uh, herding breeds have a particular play style. They tend to um, what some people call fun police, right? Where they run and they chase, and they knock other dogs aside. And they're very, very forward, very, very in your face. And a lot of dogs don't like that behavior and, and react aggressively to it. So poor socialization skills may be uh, a problem. Certainly we know that genetics influence behavior and that some portion of our population, just like the dog population, is introverted and shy. They, they just aren't all that into other dogs or other people or what have you. So genetics may play a role. Um, some dogs have a very, very um, high arousal level. They are easily overstimulated. So the combination of a dog that they've never met being on a leash such that they can't reach the other dog and sounds and cars going by, that's all too much. And they just don't know what to do with themselves. Those are the, and I know you've seen them, the high-pitched whining dogs kind of flinging and tossing themselves at the end of the leash. Ah, 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 that high-pitched stress sound. Um, and it's, it's over arousal. And they can't contain themselves. They just don't know what to do with themselves. Uh, frustration may play a role. Uh, leash certainly cons constrains them. They can't get to things. And that could cause the quote unquote reactivity. Um, if they have come to associate the appearance of certain stimuli with being punished, um, because some people use a lot of punishment on their dog. You know, no, don't do that. No, don't do that. Well, <laughs> that means that every time <laughs> That stimulus, another dog, a person, whatever, appears, they get nailed, right? No, don't do that. Wouldn't you be worried at that point of the, of the game? <coughs> uh, so that can cause uh, reactivity. Uh, learning, learning can play a role. You know, what happens? You, they, things walk towards you, and then if you continue on your path, they're also walking away from you. So they walk towards you, bark, 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 and they're gone. They walk towards you, bark, 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 and they're gone. So what's that teaching the dog? I bark and I lunge and they go away. So maybe I should keep doing that, because that worked, right? Um, and then uh, some dogs, like I said, just have a very, very rough play style. Um, they're, they're very exuberant, high energy, and that may be mi misinterpreted as reactive. Uh, so before you begin, uh, you want to make sure that your dog is kitted out in the right kind of equipment. You need to be able to control the dog and control them in a non-painful manner. 
and be able to get their attention, or at least redirect them towards you as best you're able. And in order to do that, the best bet is probably going to be either a head halter or head collar of some sort that goes around the head and muzzle, because that puts the fulcrum point underneath the chin and directs the dog's head in the direction that you want them to go. So dogs off staring into space, you can gently guide them to look at you with the, with the head halter. Not yank, not pull, just gently guide them in the direction that you need them to go. Fortunately or unfortunately as the case may be, head halters are difficult for a lot of people to use correctly <coughs> and very difficult for a lot of people to get their dogs to accept. There's not something as a general rule that you could just slap on and expect the dog to be fine with it. They feel weird. The dog's a paw. They don't like it that. So it has to be a general introduction. And if people don't do a general introduction, a lot of times the dog then perceives the head halter as being aversive, and they don't want it put on. They'll, there's avoidance behavior created. So often, the best bet is actually a no-pull harness. Most dogs will tolerate harnesses quite well. The front point of attachment, same idea. If the dog tries to lunge, it, the fulcrum points here, it pulls them off balance. Because remember, we're always using our two legs against their four. I don't care how you know, macho you are. That's a lot of leverage. So you want to have a mechanical advantage, if that possible. Put it at the front, pulls them off ba balance, and more easy for you to, to control them. So again, most people go to a no-pull harness simply because it's easier to get the dog to accept. Uh, a buckle collar or a mart uh, martingale collar. Martingale is one that provides a little bit of pressure so that they can't slip out of the collar but doesn't choke. Just closes up around the neck. Um, often a double leash and or a safety snap is a good idea, especially if you've got one of these that's really leaping or that flips over or that backs out of the harness. You need to have multiple points of contact to make sure that you have control over your dog. And um, if there are issues of redirection or your dog has any kind of a bite history, you want to introduce them to a basket muzzle and have a basket muzzle on while you're working with them to prevent injury to yourself and, and others, right? Treats. You need to figure out what kind of treats the dog likes. And we're talking high, high value treats. Chicken, jerky, cheese, good stuff. Good stuff that gets their attention and makes them wor worth their while for them to focus on you. Um, in some situations, a tug or a toy or a ball may be appropriate. It depends. Um, when they breed working dogs, they breed for that ball obsession or that tug toy obsession. If you have a dog that has that kind of obsession, that kind of focus on the ball or toy, by all means, use it to your advantage. Use it to distract him. Use it to redirect him. Um, that is certainly worth considering. But most of my clients, they're pet dogs. They're like, eh, a tug. Bark, 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 bark. <laughs> so we need to whip out things. Uh, for example, with my border collie, that would be a manchego cheese. Please, not American. <laughs> not not low-fat string cheese. Manchego. So just letting you know. Um, whoops, wrong way. Let's go this way. There we go. So this is an example of a head halter with a secondary point of attachment to secure it to a buckle collar so that you don't have to worry about the dog accidentally breaking out or breaking, breaking loose. So there's a, you can see where the arrow's pointing and it's showing the safety snap going to the, to the buckle collar. This is an example of a front attachment harness. There are all different kinds of brands out there. And many of the trainers prefer a freedom harness or a balance harness because they have multiple points of adjustment, which makes it easier to fit to the different body types or body conformation. But honestly, any front attachment harness that will stay on your dog is, is good enough. OK, so if we don't want them to bark and lunge at whatever it is that's worrying them, for whatever reason it may be, what do we need to do? We need to teach them what we want them to do instead, 
That's called teaching an alternative behavior. And in this case, alternative behavior is to look at me or watch me. So dogs that are reactive tend to be scanning their environment. They are vigilant. Watching, 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 watching. Oh my gosh, it's a dog, right? They latch in and they, they look. And depending on the dog, you may have half a second, five or 10 seconds before that latching on and pulling goes into the bark, 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 bark lunge sequence. So what we want to do is when we see him scanning, and we see a dog on the horizon, instead of him latching in with his eyes and starting that sequence, we want to ask him to watch me or look at me to cut that sequence off, right? Stop the sequence from progressing. Sounds really simple. <laughs> and it is. Really simple. But guess what? It's not really easy. You have to practice, 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 practice. Because you want it to be an automatic response. And the face of a stimulus for the dog is very disturbing for whatever reason, right? So you have to start out practicing, for example, in your kitchen, in your living room, in your backyard, on your front porch. So you work through gradually more and more intense levels of distraction to get them to the point where they're going to be able to look away from the worrisome thing and look at you for direction about what to do next. Okay, We've got this, bud. We're good. Look at me, and I'm going to tell you what to do next. You don't have to worry. We got it. Same, it's exact same thing as a medical team practicing cardiopulmonary resuscitation over and over and over and over again so that it's almost muscle memory by the time that happens. So you don't have to think, what do I do next? Where is, you know, where does my hand go? Where do I position myself? Automatic, automatic. So practicing over and over and over again. So alternative behavior one was look at me, right? Alternative behavior two, our next thing in our toolbox is the U-turn or let's go cue. Dog scanning, 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 uh, <laughs> sees a dog coming down the, the block. Hey, bud, let's go. 180 degrees in the opposite direction, we're out of here. Preferably with a jaunt to you. A bit of a, let's go, let's have fun, we're out of here, come on, bud. Um, to get him to do that automatic 180. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to avert disaster, right? You're trying to prevent him from going through that whole bark and lunch sequence. And instead, we're out of here. So trying to avoid the confrontation rather than participating one, trying to keep them from practicing that unwanted behavior over and over again. We don't want them to practice because we don't want them to get better at it. So avoidance is key. So let's go or we're out of here. 180 and moving, moving at speed out of the situation. So that's two. So you've got the look at me cue, you've got the let's go cue, and now here's the third one. And what's that? Usually a touch or a target cue. So touch, you're familiar with that one? Touch, touch. Usually we use a hand because you've got your hands with you all the time, right? Don't have to worry about remembering to bring a target with you. So you've got your hand. And when you ask the dog to touch, the dog pushes or bumps it with his nose. Well, OK, remember the sequence, scanning, 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 scanning. Oh, there's a dog coming. Now you put your, your hand in front of the dog's face and say, touch. And in order to do that, they have to direct your attention to your hand and touch your hand, right? So then you can move sideways a little bit more. Touch, sideways a little bit. Touch. And guess what? Now he's not looking at that dog anymore. So that's another tool in your toolbox. That's alternative behavior number three. Because what we're trying to avoid is this, right? I, I don't know about you. But I found 
as I've gotten a little bit more mature, <coughs> holding onto a lunging dog somehow has lost its appeal. I just, don't, I just don't find that to be the high point of my day, especially in the weather that we've had this winter on a slick surface where you have no purchase. I mean, it can be not fun. So we want to avoid this. Emergency behavior, alternative behavior number four is a sit-stay or what I jokingly call a get behind me Satan cue. Right? Get behind me. So this is where you ask him to sit by your side and hold that position. And in doing so, you are promising them, this is a contract, people, you are promising them that you are going to take care of this for them. So they sit and stay, and you step in front of them, or you send them behind you. And this is for all those people who have their dogs on flex leashes that are running at you, all the neighbors that insist on having their dogs off leash, even though it's illegal, all the ones that pop through the electric fences, even though it's documented that electric fences fail on average 40 to 50% of the time. Okay. Because, I'm sorry, the more urbanized we've gotten, the more suburbanized we've gotten, the more likely you are to run into that situation or that problem. It's not uh, when, or I should say it's not if, it's when, right? It's going to happen. So you need to have a way to help your dog out. And so the sit-stay, emergency sit-stay, or the get-behind-me cue is a way to, to deal with that. Or you're on that narrow walkway that we talked about. And... I don't know about you, my luck is such that I look right, I look left, nobody's around, and then I start on that pedestrian bridge, and when I'm halfway across, that's when the person on the flexi leash comes, and there's nowhere to go, right? So step beside the pylon, ask my dog to sit, stay, step in front of the dog, and start feeding chicken tail. And the person goes, ah, your dog's really fat. No, move along. <laughs> Can we say, no, you can't, <laughs> right? And then, let's go, we're out of here. We're gonna, as soon as they kind of pull even, we're, we're gonna go, we're gonna move on. We're not gonna be uh, pushing our luck. So, you also wanna plan escape routes. When you, cause most of you probably walk the same paths over and over again. Cause that's what we do, right? So, be aware of places that you can step off the path. Be aware of shrubs that you can step behind. Be aware of where there's a parked car that you can use as a barrier. Uh, just kind of keep in mind of where some of those safety places are that you can use to your advantage in terms of the geography to help mitigate the problem. Remember, we talked about mitigation, management, and then part of our treatment program. Okay. Um, if you do actually have a dog running towards you um, and are afraid that they're going to come at your dog and tackle, what it, one of the things that you can do when your dog's sitting behind you, uh, st step in front, grab a handful of treats and throw them at the oncoming dog. And a firm, stiff sit <laughs> at the dog coming at you. Um, often we'll, we'll, we'll back them off long enough for the owner to be able to grab the, the dog. Usually followed by an owner yelling, don't worry, he's friendly, <laughs> right? As they, as they run along. Like, oh. So um, you may want to carry some items with you to help provide additional support if necessary. Things like citronella-based spray shield if you have a, a real issue with dogs in your neighborhood. Um, a pop-up umbrella works really well, too. Of course, then they may be traumatized, and then I'll be seeing them for that. But, <laughs> but at least they'll stay off your dog. All right. So alternative behavior number five <coughs> is a go-to place or go-to mat um, cue. And the idea behind that is, again, the, the down stay or the, the, the um, stay in place allows you some maneuverability. 
It also allows you, in some situations in and around the home, to direct the dog to that place or location, if need be, if the dog's worried about people, for example, to get the dog to move away from people and go to a safe place, which would be their mat. The mat is transportable, so meaning that you could take it with you to various places and locations. I, Clearly remember going to um, an area dog conference where dogs were allowed and having seeing everyone's dogs lined up on their respective mats because that behavior had been so trained uh, with the with the various uh, dog trainers' dogs. Um, and the idea is to eventually uh, use that and work towards a relax or a, a settle or one of my clients uses chill as a as a cue, but basically to decrease arousal and get the dog to start to calm down. We're okay, chill, settle, relax. Okay. So think of these alternative behaviors as foundation skills. They're uh, different alternatives that you can use when you get into one of these high stress situations. Um, to allow you to safely and effectively manage your dog in order to be able to mitigate and hopefully prevent the dog from reacting in situations where in the past they would have um, basically lost control, right? Been over the top and, and have been unmanageable. Um, the idea is to prevent them from practicing those behaviors at all, uh, in a, practicing the unwanted behaviors by doing the alternative behavior instead to prevent them from getting better at those unwanted behaviors. So you're, instead of this, instead of the barking lunging, sit. Instead of the barking lunging, look at me. Instead of the barking lunging, let's go. Instead of the barking lunging, lie down, settle. So alternatives. You, you need to be able to, if he's not to do A, he, you need to tell him what he needs to do instead, B, right? Um, once you've established those foundation skills in your home, you want to be able to take them on the road and start practicing them as you go out and about. And in order to do that, you have to establish a gradient. You have to know what it is that your dog reacts to. Is it kids? OK, well, kids come in all ages, sizes, and genders. So can you be more specific? OK, um, young kids. Okay, not teenagers, yeah, not teenagers, okay. Um, boys or girls, hmm, boys, okay. So young boys, um, not teenagers, mm, does it matter what, what nationality they are? Any nationality, people of color, white kids, black kids, does it matter? Makes no difference, okay. So all young boys cause your dog to react. Standing still, running. Making noises? What, what are the things that cause your dog to react? Is it just the presence of the child sets them off? Or is it a young boy screaming as they're dragging uh, tin cans r running along in front of your dog? Because that's different, right? It's very different. So you have to establish a gradient. When my dog reacts to other dogs, he only reacts to male black dogs at a distance of a city block. Well, that's. You, that gives you a lot of wiggle room to work with. If, on the other hand, when my dog reacts to dogs, he reacts to every single dog we see as soon as we step out of the condo, doesn't matter what the distance is, doesn't matter what the color is, doesn't matter what the size is, doesn't matter what the dog's doing, that's more difficult. So you have to establish a gradient. And the idea behind that is that you're going to try and control exposure as much as possible. So if your dog normally reacts, say, at a distance of 20 feet to another dog, you're going to start practicing those foundation skills at a distance of 30 feet, right? Making sure that he'll sit, making sure that he'll look at you, making sure that he'll do less go at a distance of 30 feet. So under threshold, below the point where the dog normally reacts, in order to, again, make that behavior foolproof, and solid before you start moving closer and moving closer and moving closer and moving closer. Um, so 
That business of moving closer over time is called approximations. So basically, if you're able to maintain his attention at 25 feet, then the next time you're going to try it at 20 feet. If you can maintain attention at 20 feet, then the next time you're going to try it at 15 feet, and so on and so forth on down the line. And please understand, it is not a seamless process. So you may progress very, very rapidly. Oh, I've got this, right? <laughs> we all have a tendency to get a little cocky at some point or another. I've got this. 35 feet, no problem. 30 feet, no problem. Um, 25 feet, no problem. 20 feet, oops. Oh, well, that didn't, that didn't go well. Wait, so we'll back up to 30 feet. Oops, he's reacting now. <laughs> oops, uh, two steps back, one step forward. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be um, a come and go kind of a thing. But over time, uh, with gradual approximations, keeping them below threshold, not getting strong reactions from them, practicing those behaviors, you will make improvements. So you're going to start out with the really easy stuff. And a dog never reacts to other dogs when we're off my property and out of the park. OK, so now you're going to practice those behaviors out in the park so that you're sure that they're solid. Next time, you're going to practice maybe down the block, but not in your yard, because you know the dog reacts in your yard, but you're getting closer, so on and so forth, making the approximations. And then remember what I told you. It sounds very simple, but it is not easy. It requires a lot of repetitions, and the number of repetitions vary from dog to dog. <coughs> and your environment. Oops, sorry. Let's see here. OK, so you've done all of that. You've done all of that, um, and it is, it is not working. So the most common reasons for this not to work are threefold. One is, is that people get greedy, and they try and skip steps, or they try and move ahead too quickly before the behavior is really solid at the previous step. Um, and then the, it kind of falls apart. People get frustrated, the dog gets frustrated, we all get frustrated, and, and, um, and we experience a general meltdown and kind of have to regroup. So that's one. Um, the other is, is that people frequently uh, do not pay attention to thresholds. So when I talk to folks about staying below threshold, that means that your dog is actually happy to be out and about and interacting with you. That does not mean that when they're taking treats from you, they're engulfing your entire hand in their mouth because they're so stressed and overwrought that they're, 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 they're sharking on you and consuming your entire arm. That is, yes, they're taking food, but no, they are not happy and they are not relaxed. Don't, do not kid yourself. So a happy, relaxed dog is, happy to interact with you, taking treats politely, giving you his attention, um, not overstimulated, overwrought, overworried. Right? So people often don't understand what exceeding threshold means. They think that just because the dog's not lunging, that all is well, and that is not the case. You're, lo you're looking for more than that. You're looking for calm, measured response from your dog. And then last but not least is the environment itself. Um, again, I live Western Loudoun, hour and a half from here. I can go out on a walk around 9 or 10 o'clock on a weekday, and I won't see a single person. I'll walk for two hours. Down here in Bethesda, not so much, right? So you start walking, and there's a dog, and there's another dog. And then there's two dogs. And then there's two dogs barking at each other. And, then, you know, and the list goes on and on and on and gone. So you have to realize that for dogs, just like us, all those stimuli are, are cumulative. It adds up. I mean, if I uh, drive home through bucolic Western Loudoun and get back to my place and all is well, I'm going to be in a good mood. But if instead I've been stuck in traffic on the Beltway, um, my boss just finished yelling at me for no apparent reason that I can determine. Um, I've got a migraine headache. Um, I pull up in front of my house and I realize I have a flat tire. 
And when I walk in my door, the, my significant other says to me, did you remember to do blah, blah, blah? It's not going to go well, right? Because it's cumulative. And it's the same with our dogs. So if they're being constantly bombarded, constantly exposed, you can't get away from the stimuli, it's going to be really, really hard for them to learn. It's going to be really, really hard for them to pay attention. And in that situation, we may have to talk about um, pharmacological help because there's nothing that you can do to mitigate that environment for them. Although, I will tell you, a fair number of my clients, only half joking, we talk about them joining the Midnight Walkers Club, <laughs> right? Trying an alternative location, trying an alternative time, trying a different route, so, something to try and minimize the exposure. But it's not always feasible or possible, depending on your lifestyle and what's going on. So there are some things that you can try just kind of as a baseline level to reduce anxiety and stress. One of those things is uh, pheromones. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with them or not, but pheromones are chemical messengers, chemical signals that are given within a species to stimulate activities such as calm behavior, such as sexual behavior, such as um, migration behavior, um, territorial behavior, that kind of thing. So in dogs, uh, an appeasing pheromone has been identified. So it's called dog appeasing pheromone. It is released by the lactating mom dog when she's feeding her puppies to create an overall calming effect. Um, there have been a fair number of studies done on pheromones in a number of different species. Um, they are species specific. And the data out there is, there's some pretty decent evidence that it does promote overall calming. Whether it's going to be helpful to your reactive dog or not remains to be seen with your particular dog, but it's certainly worth trying. And probably if we're talking about leash reactivity, the most sane way to deliver a pheromone would be through a collar. So collars, the way they work, they're applied in close contact to the skin, and the warmth of the skin causes release of the pheromone. So with a collar, wherever the dog goes, the pheromones are going to go with them. So it's worth a try. Something to think about that may help reduce anxiety and um, give you a better way to reach your dog. Um, wraps. It's kind of like swaddling in babies or, or uh, pressure wraps in um, people or children with autism uh, called the thunder wrap. Uh, and it is a, looks like a, a doggy blanket, but it's made out of stretchy material with Velcro associated with it. So it can be pulled snug around the dog and apply pressure to the body. Some clients swear by them. Other people say doesn't do, you know, got some people shaking their heads, doesn't do squat. <laughs> um, they have a pretty good return policy associated with it, money back guarantee, so it's worth a, worth a try. Again, a no harm, no foul method that may help. Same idea behind uh, T-touch wraps, if any of you do the do T-touch or are familiar with um, massage may be another way to reduce overall anxiety and stress in your dogs. Again, we're trying to get these dogs to relax, trying to um, help them be less aroused in order for them to not be so easily triggered. And again, Tellington Jones, the T-Touch is probably the most widely known method that's used in dogs, but it's something that you could consider as well. I think. Your, dog friend, your dog's friend periodically offers T-Touch classes if you have a, an interest in that. But many of the dogs honestly just enjoy deep rubbing or deep massaging. You can kind of tell how into it they are because they lean into you and they kind of become loose, loose noodles. So I can't give you a good dog example, but I can give you a good horse example. Um, I was gifted, I guess you could call it that, a very, very fearful horse. Um, the reason he was taken off the show circuit is because of his fearfulness and his constant spookiness. So in horses, one of the main ways that they communicate is often through uh, nibbling or touch. And uh, one of the places that they commonly 
uh, touch or groom each other is over the withers. So this, dog, this horse had a very strong spook and bolt response. His alternative behavior that I taught him was rubbing the withers and waiting until he dropped his head. So we got that, scra the scratching and the head drop um, pretty much under, under cue control. Because in the past when he got worried, which happens with our reactive dogs, people would tighten up on the reins, right? Just like you tighten up on the leash in order to prevent the bolting behavior. So the alternative behavior was rubbing and scratching, right? The relaxation response and the dropping of the head. So he would see something worrisome, grab the reins by the buckle, loose reins, scratch the withers, drop the head. So an alternative behavior to spooking and running. So it can be very effective. Um, no particular studies in dogs on this technique, but I'm sure you're aware that dogs are very attuned to touch and people. There are some great studies looking at petting and shelter dogs, decreasing cortisol levels, um, and certainly a, a really lovely study in pet dogs where the owners, um, the dogs had blood drawn without owner contact, and then uh, the other half, it was a double, they um, flipped it, reversed it, and the owners were petting the dogs through the blood draw, much lower cortisol levels in the dogs that were being petted during blood draws. So we know it has an effect, so it's worth considering. Uh, supplements that are out there that you may want to consider to help reduce anxiety and, and consequently arousal and hopefully reactivity would be things like uh, zilkine, which is an alpha casazopine. It's a milk protein derivative that has an overall calming effect that can be given on a daily or twice daily basis. Some pretty good data to back that one up in uh, people, horses, rodents, cats, and dogs. Uh, Soliquin is a chew that contains some active ingredients that have an overall calming effect. Um, but no, we know that the individual active ingredients can have an effect at the right concentrations, but there's no particular studies on the efficacy of Soliquin itself. Uh, composure, Composure Pro, those are calming chews as well. Again, they have individual ingredients in them that we know have an overall calming effect, but the concentration is quite low. So I see some efficacy in small dogs, but in large dogs, you'd have to be giving handfuls of this stuff for it to be effective. And then last on the list is anxetine, which is L-theanine, a green tea extract or derivative. Uh, uh, works on the same receptors, um, uh, GABA receptors that benzodiazepines work on, things like Valium, and it has an overall calming effect, but no specific papers looking at its efficacy and impulse control or reactivity, but certainly worth trying. Yeah. Um, how do you get those that had trouble getting Solomon? I've heard you need a prescription and don't need a prescription, and two, what do you think of CBD oil? Can we get to the, that question at the end of the talk, please? If you remind me, um, I'd be happy to answer that question. Thank you. Oops, again. There we go. There's some diets out there as well that are known to have an overall calming effect. Uh, Royal Canin Calm is one of them. It contains casazepine in it, as well as B vitamins, uh, nicotinamide. And there are actually a couple of papers looking at decreased anxiety associated with this diet. Again, because of the concentration of the active ingredient, it's only going to be effective in dogs up to about 30 pounds. It is a prescription diet, which means that you have to get it through a veterinarian in order to obtain it. Oops. Okay, so if you've tried all the supplements, you've tried everything that you know how to do, and you're not making progress what do you do next? So commonly, I have people come to me, and they will have been working with a trainer, and they say to me, you know, I tried all that stuff. Often it's interspersed with four-letter words, right, because they're frustrated by that point. I've tried all that. 
and it's not working. You know, it, obviously this isn't, it, is it right? Well, remember what we talked about, right? It's usually the environment. It's usually because they can't es escape the stimuli. It's usually because they can't keep the dog below threshold. If you can't do those things, then you have to use, you have to use medication. You're not going to make progress uh, without it. Or you could move to the country, or you could rehome the dog. But it's wishful thinking to think that you can do the same thing over and over again and, and get different results, right? So what, what are we talking about when we talk about medications? We're talking about things like benzodiazepines, which are uh, Xanax, Valium, that, that kind of medication. We're talking about serotonin, norepinephrine antagonists, like trazodone, which may, some of you may be familiar with. We're talking about alpha-2 agonists, um, such as um, cilio, which is what this picture is right here. It's a gel that you apply to the gums. And we're talking about beta blockers, such as propranolol, which have gotten a lot more press of late because they're being used in returning veterans for PTSD reactions. Same over-the-top arousal for everyday stimuli. Same idea. The way that um, propranolol and the um, uh, cilio, the, the blockers, work is they block the release of norepinephrine in the brain. So they prevent that over-the-top response, that huge arousal reaction that you would see in these dogs, hopefully allowing them to be calm enough to be able to respond to your cues, allowing you to get your foot in the door to work with them on the, teaching them alternative behaviors. I mean, as you can imagine, if they're busy lunging, barking, spinning, spewing, they, there's no way that they're going to be able to focus on you and, and do something different, right? So the idea of medication is to calm that response, decrease arousal, raise their threshold, so that you have a window of opportunity in which you can redirect them, right? And reinforce that alternative behavior. So, and I, I'm sure you've seen it. I mean, dogs that react like, like that, right? There's, there is no opportunity to be able to intervene. As soon as they see another dog, they're barking and lunging. They, you, there's no window to be able to get in there and help them. In some situations, so with those short-term medications, what we end up doing is we end up using them on an as-needed basis, often one to two hours prior to the worrisome event. So one to two hours before the walk, one to two hours before visitors come in the home, uh, one to two hours before whatever the stressful event may be. In some situations, that's not enough. The events are happening on a daily basis. For example, somebody living in an apartment in downtown DC who has to walk their dog two to three times a day and take the elevator or the stairs and walk through the hallway two to three times a day, there's no escaping it. There's no getting away from it. It's happening, it's happening constantly. So in that situation, we may also put them on a maintenance medication so that it's not something that's spiking and you know, medication up, medication down, medication up. Medication. They, so that they're on a, a maintenance medication to reduce their overall level of arousal, calming effect, anti-anxiety effect, just quieting things down a little bit. Um, and possibly with the addition of as-needed medication as well. Just depends. But those are kind of, kind of what we're looking at. I should tell you that with medication, we do not want to drug the dog. We do not want to have it staggering or gorped or sedated. That is not the object. We do not want to change its personality. That is not what we want to do. That is not where this is going. We do want them and you to have a good quality of life. 
and to be able to negotiate their environment without having a meltdown two and three and four times a day. So that's, that's what, we're, what we're looking at. The two main maintenance medications usually come from two major drug categories, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, which it would be Prozac is probably the best known one, fluoxetine, but there are, I don't know, 20 some different kinds of SSRIs out there. And the other family is the TCAs, the tricyclic acids. Probably the most commonly known ones in that group are uh, Clomacalm or clomipramine, but amitriptyline is another well-known one from that, from that family. So we talked about the alternative behaviors. We talked about making sure that the dog stays below threshold. Um, and then what about if it's not just enough to kind of get their attention and scoot out of the way? What if you actually want them to get better or show some progress. Um, you can certainly do desensitization and counter conditioning. I mentioned it a little bit when we I talked about gradual exposure. But again, the idea behind this is to develop a concrete plan where you take into account the dog's distance from the stimuli, the type of stimuli it relaxes to, um, how difficult it is to get their attention, and gradually move the animal closer and closer to the stimuli. One of the issues that we have with dogs that are dog reactive is that when you're out and about, you often have no real specific control over the stimuli. I mean, people are walking their dogs kind of go wherever they need to go. So practicing can be difficult. Controlling distances can be difficult. And in that regard, often something like a reactive dog class is useful because in that class, you'll be working with professionals and other dogs. And they will help you. They will, it'll be an artificial situation, a practice situation, where you can set the distance and practice your dog's response instead of having to worry about somebody popping up out of the bushes with you, you know, with another dog. So that's the idea. Again, you have to make sure that you stay below threshold, that you have the dog's attention, and that the dog clearly understands what it's supposed to do instead of barking and lunging. Because if you're not careful, you can actually, in some situations, make it worse, where the dog becomes more worried, more afraid, more anxious, because these things are being, he's being exposed to them like more and more often with your practice, and they actually become sensitized or more worried. Um, okay. So some additional advice that I can give you is um, don't deceive yourself and pretend or think, oh, he'll grow out of it. Oh, it'll get better over time. I don't know, what are the usual excuses that we do? I, oh, it's not that bad, <laughs> right? We've all been guilty of that. Um, yeah, so don't, don't think that it's going to get better on its own. If you do nothing else, try and avoid situations that are likely to trigger your dog. And the question is, people go, well, if I never get him out there, how is he going to get any better at it? But the dog's already reacting in an abnormal way, OK? He's already telling you that he's not happy with the situation, right? So if he was going to get better on his own, he would have done so. And by getting him out there, all you're doing is practicing behavior that you don't want him to do over and over again. So avoid, avoid the situation or prevent the situation. But don't just do it over and over again and, like I said, expect different results. That's the definition of madness. Um, distract the dog. Redirect the dog. Whatever you need to do to get their attention away from the worrisome stimuli. And um, try, as best you're able, to not make, let your behavior become a predictor to the dog of bad things coming.
And I, believe you me, I know it's hard. It is very, very hard. But so you see the dog coming down the road. Your dog hasn't even noticed him yet, right? And you grab the leash because, by gosh, he's not going to get away from you. And the dog's like, what, what, what? You know, what's, what's going on? Why, you know, why did she just grab my? And pretty soon, that tensing up on the leash can be a clear indicator to the dog that they should be worried because you do it every time a dog comes down the pike. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't hold on to your dog, but tr try as best you're able to not to remain calm. Yelling at him is not going to help. Crying, swearing, you know, all the variety of things that we do, not going to help. Just get him out of there. And try again tomorrow. Try something different the next day. But um, just be aware that your own behavior can communicate to the dog that they should be worried. So try and remain calm. So I often get asked this. I feel like, well, what could I do to prevent this from happening? You know, well, you don't have a lot of control over your dog being tackled by the random dog running down the street. I mean, that nobody wanted that. So in some regards, probably it's not possible always to prevent this from happening. Um, in general, getting a, a puppy at an appropriate age from a good background and adequately socializing them is going to provide you with as much protection as possible. But I'm telling you, these urban environments are hard on these dogs. So I wrote a post for Psychology Today entitled, Is Your Dog Perfect? No, Neither Is Mine. And the gist of the blog is that service dogs trainers, um, things like Guiding Eyes for the Blind, have moved from random source dogs so that they bred a certain genetic line of dogs over many, many, many generations to make sure they're behaviorally solid. And even then, their washout rate is fairly high, 40%, right? And they go through a training program, one to two years of training specifically to be able to maneuver urban environments. One to two years. Do we do that with our dogs? Do we get them from specific genetic backgrounds that have been selected for being behaviorally solid? No, we don't. And then we're surprised when it's also overwhelming for them and they aren't able to cope adequately. So. <clears throat> Just be aware that despite your best efforts, this may happen. And you may not have the ideal dog for walking in that situation. We may have to do environmental modifications. We may have to do medication. And that's just kind of the way it is uh, with a lot of them. Can you help with training? You bet. Absolutely. Will medication help? Yes, it will. Is your dog cured? Is your dog fixed? Remember at the beginning of the talk? No. Dog's not cured. Dog's not fixed. Treated, mitigated, managed, but not fixed, right? So avoid iffy situations, people. I, if I had 10 bucks for every time a client walked in and said, my dog was fine until I took it to the dog park and, I would be wealthy. I would not be here lecturing to you. I'd be in Aruba somewhere, right? <laughs> So just to let you know, it's a frequent issue. It's a frequent problem. I can't tell you how many people take their dogs to the dog park because they want them to learn to, learn to get along with other dogs. They want to learn to them to be socialized. And the dog has a bite history, and they're turning it loose in the dog park. So just avoid, avoid iffy situations. <coughs> this uh, next article here, I pulled from my own Loudoun newspaper. And I don't know if you can clearly see this or not, but it, it's a letter to the editor about the Flower and Garden Show, which is a big thing in, in Loudoun. It happens every year in the spring. And it says um, there's, there were signs posted all over saying, leave your dog at home. And yet, uh, they counted. This, this person who wrote this editorial letter counted 27 dogs. And, 
And I don't know if you've been in downtown Leesburg, it's narrow. And then they have the vendor booths, which makes it narrower. And then it's packed with people. And now you've got 27 dogs packed into that area. And there probably were more. Um, and if you follow this letter more, they were all, most of them were on retractable leashes. So people talk in, and the dogs are off, off doing this. So that was, that was just in my backyard. Um, I posted another blog post, because I went to uh, get some plants at a native plant sale. I'd been to this venue before. I knew it was a pretty good venue, out and about, open space. You know, there weren't going to be a lot of dogs. I was stopped, and my dog was touched or petted, on average, six times an hour, every 10 minutes. I couldn't, I couldn't go more than one row my dog being without permission. People just touching. And multiple, when I was trying to check out or look at something, the dog was on cue by my side, people touching the dog, just going up and grabbing the dog. So public spaces, the dog has to be solid <laughs> when they go out in public spaces like that. And it, it is not fun for a lot of dogs. My dog loves people, loves people. So it was annoying to me because he was being encouraged to break a, a cued behavior, but it, it, nobody was going to get hurt. But if he was reactive to people, bad news. Right? So some resources for you, some additional resources to think about or consider. There's a book by McConnell called Feisty Fido, which talks about leash reactivity. Uh, for those of you who are into the nitty-gritty details of the neuroscience and the basis of the behavior, this is a very, very good book. This is for the, the training nerds among us, uh, fired up, frantic, and freaked out. Very, very good book. Um, if you're looking for general information on, on behavior, there is some information in there on reactivity. It's called Decoding Your Dog by the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists. Um, but it has, it's easy to read because it has individual chapters on key problem areas. So if you have separation anxiety, you have storm phobias or what have you, you can uh, selectively read those chapters. And then with that in mind, I am very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yell them out to me because I am semi-deaf and I will repeat the question so that everybody can. Sorry. So uh, how to get some of the supplements like Soliquin, I've heard you need a prescription, you don't need a prescription for that, and what do you think of CBD oil? Okay, so the, uh, the question is two parts. One was, uh, what about Soliquin? Is that something that a prescription is required? And the answer is, is it is sold through veterinarians. It is not a a drug that's commonly available in Petco or PetSmart, that kind of thing. Um, so in order to obtain it, you shouldn't, it shouldn't require a prescription. It's not a controlled medication, but it is sold through veterinarians. And then the second question was with regards to CBD. And excuse me if I sigh a little bit and also roll my eyes at the same time. CBD is the new new hot thing out there, right? Um, I noticed that Martha Stewart just cut a deal to have CBD products for pets under the Martha Stewart name and brand. <laughs> the problem with, uh, with CBD is that it is regulated as a supplement, not as a medication. What that means is, is that there is no quality control associated with the product, be it there's no quality control. So what that means is, is when the Food and Drug Administration has gone and looked at various companies that are producing CBD, it may or may not have the amount of CBD in it that's indicated. It may or may not have traces or even substantial amounts of THC in it, which is the hallucinogenic component. It may or may not have other carriers, that kind of thing. Um, batches of, of uh, CBD vary in strength depending on where the product's harvested, the time of the year, that kind of thing. So quality control is a real issue or problem. In addition to that, we have very little to no research on CBD in dogs. 
There's one study that has been published out of uh, Cornell University on osteoarthritis pain relief in pets. That study had a grand total of eight dogs in the study, <laughs> which is not a huge number statistically. It did look very promising. Um, but again, we just have limited data on it. And then of special concern to me in my situation is that CBD is metabolized by the same enzyme systems that many of the psychoactive drugs that I prescribe are metabolized by. And we're not clear on what that does. Does it make the drug, the other drug more available? Does it make it less available? Are there any interactions we should be afraid of? We just don't know. There's an excellent, excellent article uh, published by Consumer Reports on CBD products and pets. So if you go into a Consumer Reports website and search for CBD pets, you can access that article and it'll give you a lot of really, really good background information. But thank you for that question. Yes? I have two questions. Uh, number one, back to the pheromones. Mm -hmm. uh, if I used it on the with the collar uh, dispensing mechanism, would I put that on the dog right before walking, or do I keep it on them all the time? So her question was about the pheromone collar, how, what the most appropriate use is. And the best use for that collar is to put it on the dog and leave it on. Um, you want it to have close contact with the skin because it's the warmth of the skin that's going to cause that vapor diffusion to occur. Um, and the collar will last approximately 30 days with that close contact. So that's the best way to use it. And then my second question is uh, the term leash reactivity. I mean, my dog <coughs> is reactive, I think, doesn't matter. You know, whether he's on leash or off leash. Um, so is there like a difference in dogs with being leash reactive as opposed to just being reactive? So some dogs, uh, the fact that, I'm sorry, let me repeat the question. So she's asking, is there a difference in, in how we think of dogs that are quote unquote reactive both on leash and off leash? Is there a difference? And the fact that some dogs are reactive on leash, but then if they actually get away from the owner and approach another dog, they actually play appropriately, or they're fine in doggy daycare, but they're only reactive when they're on leash and walking, tends to suggest that what the main problem is in that situation is that the dog is frustrated because it can't properly engage with other dogs. A dog that is unhappy with other dogs, regardless of the situation, suggests not so much frustration, but possibly fear aggression, or um, possibly just incomplete or no social skills. And I mean, let's face it, some dogs prefer to be with people. I mean, we bred them that way for thousands of years to prefer our company. Why should we be shocked that they actually like people more than other dogs? He's actually reacted to anything. I mean, not cars, not inanimate objects, but driving yeah. those baby carriages with mothers or fathers. Or, yeah. yeah. Yep, that happens for sure. Um, yes, in the back. Hey, thanks. This was great information about um, foundational skills to use when you have your dog out and about and the same with cars and dogs. But I wonder what you would um, suggest would be the main what your top recommendations would be for dogs who are reactive inside the house to the strangers coming in or knock on the door or anything that's not just the owners like, you know, coming for dinner or someone staying over. And I mean, obviously the mat would be one thing and avoidance, but do you have other um, suggestions? So her question is, what about dogs that are reactive to people entering the home, for, exa for example? And um, the motivation in that situation may, may be a little bit different than what we see in dogs that are reactive out on leash. Dogs that are reactive to people coming in their home, the two main reasons or combinations of reasons are fear-based aggression and or territorial aggression. The best thing that you can do for those dogs be, until you're able to accurately address the problem is to remove them from the situation, so putting the dog up before people enter the home 
in order to prevent that from, from occurring. Ideally, ultimately, what you would end up doing is training um, a go to the mat response with the dog so that the presence of someone at the door, the dog's default behavior is to run to their mat to be rewarded as compared to charging or guarding the door. So that's, that's the, the usual, <coughs> usual approach. Um, let's see, let's get someone, yes? The, if, uh, if you're on a walk with your dog, your dog's already maybe uh, barking or, or jumping up, lunging, um, and you try to, I guess, distract it with uh, chicken or cheese, are we reinforcing that behavior? Like if they bark and jump, they'll get cheese? Or what, what, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> what, what are you supposed to do? Yeah, yeah. So, so it is feasible or it is possible to chain those behaviors. So in other words, bark, 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 food. Bark, 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 food. I think I'll bark because I'll get food. Yeah, it's, it's possible. But remember what we talked about in terms of threshold, right? So if the, the, if the dog is over the top, barking and lunging, you're way past worrying about what you are, aren't training, what is or isn't going to happen here. You're in rescue mode, right? You're, you're in bailout mode. You're trying to get them out of there. And you're going to use whatever you need to do to get out of that situation at that point in time. And then you need to regroup. Like, how can I avoid this from happening in the, f in the future? Is there a different time I can walk the dog? Is it possible I don't have to walk the dog at all and exercise him in the backyard until I work on these foundation skills? Uh, that, that kind of approach. So I hope that that helps a little bit. And then ideally, if you start getting those foundation skills on board, what you're going to be rewarding is the dog's response to you. He sees a dog. He looks at you. You're rewarding the look right, as compared to using the food as a lure to, to distract him and get him out of there. Yeah. Yes? Then I go back to one of the um, behaviors you said was to get the dog to sit. Yes. But I also heard that if you get the dog to sit, you're actually reinforcing the fear issue because you're keeping them in a place and they feel more threatened because they can't move. Right, so remember what we talked about in terms of when you're going to use that behavior. And you're going to use that behavior when you don't have an escape route present, right? So yes, having the dog sit and then kind of holding him in place while he's being approached and bombarded by things that are scary, not so good. But remember the example that I gave you of being stuck on that bridge and having like nowhere to go? In that situation, I'm having him sit, I'm trying to body block and protect him, and I'm trying to mitigate by giving him as much uh, good stuff as possible. And as soon as I can, I'm going I'm to get out of there. I'm not going to. It's the last resort. Exactly. <coughs> you got it. Mm -hmm. um, yes? Um, so uh, the story that you're talking about, people just petting their dog without permission. <laughs> um, uh, I have a foster dog who's very fearful. And just yesterday, I had her out on a walk, and a couple people came up, and I said, you know, my two pugs, they're, you know, perfectly fine. You can pet them. She is scared of strangers. Please just ignore her. Both of them tried to pet her. <laughs> is there anything that I can put on my dog that will tell people to just leave her alone? Yep. yep. There, there are uh, little vests that say um, uh, things like, they range everywhere from I bite, to, uh, to, to don't touch me, or dog in training, or I mean, there, there are a number of different ones that you can, that you can do. I, mm -hmm. yep, yep, you'd be surprised at, at how many are out there. Do people actually pay attention to that? Yeah, a lot of them do. Um, I often tell folks to say, oh, you don't want to touch her, she's got ringworm. <laughs> and that, they don't listen to you about the please don't touch her because she's scared, but the ring room, oh, yeah, well, I don't want to do that. Oh, dogs love me. Oh, I know. Yeah. 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 So, so, they're fiddlers, so they're going to pee on you. <laughs> yes? Um, there are two of us that walk the dog, and we have very different styles. And a 
ultimately in, in the actual performing of what we need to do to prevent it from happening, um, it's very different. How does that, how, how do we deal with this and how does that affect our 17 pound beast? <laughs> Did you all hear that? I think we've all done. She, she asked, she said she has a, a significant other, a, another person who, who walks, walks the dog and has a different style from her and uh, interacts with the dog differently. And how is that going to affect overall training? And is it an issue or a problem? So obviously, just like with kids and just like with coworkers and just like with everybody else in our lives, um, if the dog receives a more consistent message, that's going to be better overall for the dog. That being said, um, dogs are not stupid. They clearly learn to differentiate. So, for example, um, hassling my husband constantly for treats and the dog never bothers me for treats. Right? So they do, they do learn to discriminate, they do learn to differentiate, but the more consistent you can be in your approach, the more likely you're going to make progress and the more likely those behaviors are going to be solid across a, across a variety of situations. So no need to uh, divorce your significant other or boot them out, um, but just be aware that consistency is a plus in, in training by all means. By all means. Uh, yes. Do you have any suggestions for where the threshold of your dog is the limit of his eyesight or hearing? Limit of eyesight and hearing? So the question is, do I have any idea about thresholds based on the limit of the dog's eyesight? If he, if he sees something, it doesn't matter how far away it is. If he hears something, it doesn't matter where it is. Okay. So his, the, the dog is, your dog is reacting regardless of distance and regardless of you may not even hear the sound and what, what to do in that situation. Um, so honestly, the dog probably needs medication in that situation because it's, it, it, the world for that dog is uh, overstimulating in all of its aspects. And if there's not any place in its life where it can be at ease, where it feels instead it has to be constantly vigilant, then it, it probably needs some medication to relax. Yeah. Let me get this side of the room, maybe. Um, yes, Parse. Yeah. Um, are dogs gener do dogs generally need, as living creatures, or desire, or play, or interaction with other dogs? Do, do they need <coughs> Oh, that's a great question. So the question is, is do dogs need social interaction? Is that part of what they as individuals require. And I think it's lovely that we're actually getting to the point where we had to actually ask that question, right? And I think the answer, as always, is a, bit, a little bit complicated and nuanced. In general, dogs are social animals. They, they have, often have relationships, if not with a huge number of animals, at least with several other conspecifics. Um, but as I mentioned, remember that we've bred them to be very interested in people and very oriented for people or towards people. So it is my experience that uh, some dogs are social butterflies and some are not. Some dogs prefer the company of other dogs and some do not. So again, using my own dog as an example, uh, the Border Collie, he is okay with dogs, but he would much rather spend his time with people. And how do I know that? He can be playing with another dog, and if a person, a new person, comes onto the scene, he leaves play <coughs> to go be petted and checked out by the new person. So I hope that answers the question. Um, yes, the black, uh, yes, and blonde hair. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> In black, yeah. Sorry, my question was, what about um, neutering dogs? I mean, I've read conflicting information, like can make them more fearful, make them less fearful. Is there an age yeah. in relation to behavior? Yeah. It's the great neuter debate, right? Um, so, 
how can I answer that? In terms of leash reactivity, uh, neutering or not neutering, uh, no impact that I am aware of or can determine. So you have a leash reactive dog, I, you're not going to hear me recommend that you neuter him to, to improve his leash reactivity. <clears throat> um, in terms of the best age to neuter dogs, in general, the consensus is now at a slightly more mature age, probably around 12 to 14 months. And the concern there is uh, skeletal concerns because of allowing proper development of hips and joints and that kind of thing. The data that's out there on behavioral changes is interesting, but not conclusive. So there have been some studies out that indicate that perhaps there is some increased anxiety if dogs are spayed or neutered before six months of age. There's some data out there that in female dogs that are spayed, that that might cause some increased aggression. Um, and we know that uh, gonadal sexual hormones are important, right? We have them for a reason. And we're kidding ourselves if we think that the only thing it does is, you know, make my ovaries happy. I mean, there's more to it than that, right? But we just don't know what all it does. So in terms of recommendations, because I just walked this walk with another client. She has a, a, a young schnauzer that has separation anxiety, and he's intact. She, he's very social. She'd like to continue him in doggy daycare, but the doggy daycare won't continue to take him because he's still intact. And her question to me was, if I neuter him, will it make his separation anxiety worse? And I'm like, ah. You know, I don't know. So the way we made that decision was, how severe is the separation anxiety? How important is it to you, right, back to your question? for this dog to be able to get out of, and about and be social. And guess what? She felt like the separation anxiety was minimal. We had good control of it. It's very important to her for her dog to be out and about and be social because she travels a lot and she takes the dog with her, right? So she wants him to maintain that sociality. So we went ahead and neutered him. And he's in doggy, continuing to doggy daycare. And so far, no, no change in the separation anxiety. <coughs> So it was a long way to answer your question. No, but. no, Yeah, there is. There really is. Um, way back with glasses. Um, I have a toy pool, and um, I sort of wondered about like trying to protect him as just picking him up if there's a loose dog, or just do I keep him down? Just, what are your thoughts about that? <laughs> I mean, we have some really big dogs in the neighborhood who are usually off leash and um, we'll come toward, you know, when it points us. Yeah. So her question is, is, you know, is associate, she has a small dog, dog's off leash, running around. Um, does she pick the dog up to protect him from being bowled over, eaten? Is that good? Is that bad? <laughs> My concern is honestly from a safety perspective for you. When you pick up your dog, that directs attention towards you, and that's how a lot of my clients have gotten bitten at some point or another, either by the dog they've picked up or by the dog that's going after the picked up dog. In terms of it being worse for your poodle one way or another, I think that you have to be concerned about her safety and do what you need to do for safety's sake. Um, I don't think that you're doing anything behaviorally bad by preventing her from being bowled over by loose, large dogs. So don't feel guilty about it. Do we want to continue with more questions, Deborah, or is it? Yeah, don't forget those ones you go up front. Yeah, well, I will, OK. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, our dog, we had him about a month with the rescue dog. He seems fine with about 50% of the dogs, and then Joe with the other 50. So it's like we're not sure. As we approach a dog, he'll sometimes be perfectly fine, and they're like friends, and then other times it's like, it's like he's going to be So what's the, we're kind of like, what, how do we do this?
So I don't know if everyone heard the question. She says that they have a relatively recent uh, dog uh, member in their family. And what they've found is when they have him out on walks that about half the time he goes past other dogs, no issues, no problems. And then about half the time he reacts rather strongly uh, to the dog and they're not seeing any particular rhyme or reason to it. And I, all I can tell you is do your very, very best to use your observational skills and see if you can start to pick out differences. White dogs, black dogs, spotty dogs, long-haired dogs, big dogs, small dogs, male dogs, female dogs. You may not always know. Um, I'm sure the pattern is very clear to your dog. Uh, just we may not be that, that great at And that's not uncommon. So many dogs will hold it together, right, as long as the other dog is neutral or ignores them. But as soon as one of those dogs barks at them, they're like, oh, heck no. That's, that's not going to work. So that's not uncommon. Um, yes? Um, what advice do you have for someone who's walking two dogs who react completely opposite from seeing another dog? One who is reactive <coughs> and one who's super friendly. Yeah. So the question is, is what, what kind of advice or what do I say to people who have uh, walk two dogs, one who's pretty friendly and relaxed and one that's reactive. And I would say what I usually tell my clients is, is that you're not going to like what I have to say, which is that ideally you wouldn't be walking both dogs together. Um, and that that would allow you to give your nice, happy social dog a nice, happy social walk and reward him for that appropriate behavior and then concentrate on your, on your trouble child um, and maybe have a different walk with that animal uh, such that you avoid some of the triggers that are setting, setting that puppy off. So, um, yes? Um, so I have a reactive dog on walk, so I hear about that a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's a golden, so everybody thinks she's friendly. And, and, uh, um, <laughs> My question is, I don't care if she barks at dogs on TV or at the mailman, but should I care about that in order to, um, in order to yeah. stop her from reacting? Yeah. So her question is, is that it, her, her statement and question, follow-up question, she has a dog that is, is leash, leash reactive. So that's a given. But her dog also does things like barks at the mailman when, or when people come to the door and barks on, at other dogs on TV. And, you know, is that, should she be concerned about that? Is that contributing to the overall issue or problem associated with leash reactivity? And as we talked about, uh, all those triggers, all those stimuli add up, making the likelihood of your dog reacting to any of those stimuli higher. Um, and it gives you an overall idea about the dog's arousal level in general. So yes, you should be concerned about it. Yes, you should be trying to do everything that you can to, to keep the dog um, from practicing those behaviors um, in order to, to better be able to manage her and help her. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, way back with the glasses. I've noticed several dogs in my park who, after a while, will be misbehaving, and then they will go to boot camp, and they'll be gone for a bit, like two or three weeks, and they will come back, and they will have a little gizmo attached to their collar, and they will behave unbelievably well. They will still play. They will still do everything they want them to do. And I'm told there's a vibrating uh -huh. setting and something that makes a little noise. And a citronella squirt. Now, what do you think of those? And what are they? And is this is something for me. So I don't buy that. And the reason I say that is I've yet to see a citronella collar work like that. The dogs usually ignore it or blast through it. I'm sorry, let me repeat the question. She's talking about dogs that go off to boot camp for training and then come back and seem to be you know, miraculously better and, and, and uh, still doing what they need to do, but their behavior is, is much improved. Um, and she say that the collars are citronella collars. One person said that they had a little citronella sport on theirs, but they 
the other ones will say, oh, it's a hearing aid. It's a, you know, it gets my dog's attention and I can talk to it and it does what I want it to do. They yeah. all still play, they act perfectly happy. Yeah. What? Yeah, so in general, when dogs are sent off to boot camp, they are sent to uh, force-based training. Force-based training usually consists, of course, of punishment methods, and by and large, are usually associated with electric shock collars. And what electric shock collars do is they cause behavioral suppression. So basically, for example, a dog's barking, whenever it barks, it's, it's zapped. And the idea behind mm -hmm. it is that you learn that if you bark, you get, you get electrocuted, right? That's what, that's what it does. Does it work? Was, these people are just working by punishment, mm -hmm. which the owner didn't necessarily know because it happened to be We are a very results-driven society. We want a quick fix. So, when I tell people that this problem's never going to go away and that it's something they're going to have to work on throughout the life of the dog, some people don't like that message at all. And they want to go to someone who tells them that they can fix the problem. What electroshock does is it punishes the behavior. It does nothing about underlying motivation in the animal. So if the dog is fearful, if the dog is frustrated, if the dog for that matter, wants to play, it doesn't matter. He's still getting punished for that behavior, right? So it does nothing about underlying motivation at all. Does behavioral suppression work? It does to some extent. I mean, if every time I went to, put, to hug you, you slapped me, I'd probably stop trying to <laughs> hug you. But my attitude towards you would certainly be affected. My attitude towards hugging and people in general is affected. And that's what they found in dogs where, where punishment has been used on a consistent basis. It affects the uh, relationship with the owner. It changes their behavior overall. And you have to be very concerned about not addressing the underlying motivation. So if, for example, the reason why the dog was barking and lunging was because it was afraid, now it's no longer barking and lunging, so the assumption is, is that the dog's no longer afraid. Bad news, because then people get closer to the dog, people put, the dog's put in situations where the dog continues to be afraid, and if the dog can't bark, and the dog can't lunge, what's the next step? They bite. Yeah, so it's not, you don't want to go there. You really, really don't want to go there. And, uh, Give me five seconds because I'm going to do the soapbox thing here. This is not new news. Okay? This information has been out there for forever. Punishment is not the, the way to go in training our coworkers, in training our dogs, in training our kids. The a National Academy of Pediatrics just ended up issuing a joint statement talking about the fallout from punishment, physical punishment in kids, including thank you very much, smaller prefrontal cortexes in kids that have been where punishment has been consistently <coughs> used on them. Think about that. Affecting brain development. Not good. So, um, yeah, please don't. Please don't do that. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up, for at least for the, the videography portion of this. I'm happy to stay afterwards and answer individual questions. Um, thank you very, very much for coming out. And I appreciate your attention.